Well, you really have to have read through Revelation 1 through 18, as we have, to appreciate what we're going to learn in chapter 19. You really have to have had experienced a degree of suffering because you stand up for Jesus to appreciate what you're about to hear in Revelation 19. But more than anything, you really have to have a love of Jesus that exceeds your love for all things and have a desire in your heart for the supremacy and glory of Jesus Christ if you want to appreciate what we're going to hear about in chapter 19. My friends, we know that Jesus has never promised us health, wealth, and prosperity. He has never promised us a life that is a bed of roses. As human beings, we all know something about trials in this fallen world. And as Christians, we all know the world's resistance to the things of Christ. We see it profoundly, as Serge said, happening to our brothers and sisters in Christ overseas as we speak. And we have witnessed it vicariously as we studied these chapters, these earlier chapters in Revelation. But the good news is that in a very real sense, Jesus is with all of us. But we also know in a very obvious sense that we are separated from our Savior. That he's not directly in that sense with us. He is in heaven and we are not. And we are separated from him. And we are pilgrims in a world that celebrates anti-God rhetoric and anti-God behavior. And that's why our hope comes from the promise of Jesus himself. And he said in John 14, 3, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Or as the angels announced in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken out from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Or as Paul said in Titus 2.13, that we should be looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. My friends, better than anywhere else in the entire Bible, today's passage talks about the return of Jesus Christ, or as we commonly call it, the second coming of Christ. Now, as you know, a few weeks back, we left off at the beginning of chapter 19, which talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And when Jesus returns at the end of chapter 19, we almost expect him to come back as a bridegroom, right? Coming back for his bride, the bridegroom. But we don't see that. We might expect him to come back as he did the first time, as a meek and a humble servant. But we don't see that as well. When we read chapter 19, we see him coming back as a conquering warrior. A conquering warrior. And if the Lord permits, we're going to try to finish chapter 19 today as we analyze our king's return. You see in the sermon outline that's in your bolt, and I always encourage you to take notes. We're going to look at three points today. The king's appellations, the king's accessories, and the king's actions. First, the king's appellations. Anybody know what that word means? I didn't either. That's why we like, a pastor likes thesauruses, right? Because we need fancy outlines that all start with the same letter. And the word name did not fit the, the little, little thing I had going here, right? So I need an A word for name. Appellation, just another word for a name or a title that someone has. So what we're looking at here in this first point are the names of Jesus. And what we look at when we see Revelation 19 is that this section, I don't know if you caught it as I read it, Jesus is referred to by four different names. Now for us today, that might not really have much significance. When we named our children, we just named our children because we like those names. Haley is Haley because we like the name of Haley. Natalie is Natalie because Julie liked the name of Natalie. And I like it as well too, but Julie had a special affection for the name of Natalie. She had a little baby when she was young. Not a, not a baby, a doll, sorry. That's how rumors start. A little doll <laughs> when she was young named Natalie. And Kayla, um, actually she was born when I was immersed in Greek um, exegesis and you had to memorize hundreds and hundreds of Greek words. And as my mind was bombarded by all this Greek memorization, uh, the word I was studying that week was kalos, which means good or beautiful. And that's where we got the name Kayla from. But back then, words had or names had significance, unlike today. They represented who you were. You read in the Bible about there's a blessing about having a good name. Your name was your reputation. Your name said something about you. So let's look at the names of Jesus first that we see 
here in Revelation 19. The first one's very interesting. I find I'm going to be dancing around a little bit today through this passage. The first one we see is in verse 12. You see it there? And it's referred simply to as a name which no one knows except himself. That's fascinating. His first name we're going to look at today is a name that no one even knows except for Jesus. Now, we play a little game in our house. It's called the Names of God game. And what we do is we go around in order, and we start off with A, and we work to B. And in order, you have to name a different name or title that God has assigned to himself. So, like, I go Alpha and Omega, and the next person, Bread of Life, Comforter, Door, Everlasting Father. And God has revealed hundreds of names of himself in Scripture. But yet, here we learn that there's another name for Jesus that has not been revealed to us. What does that mean? I think the best explanation is that this name represents some aspect of Christ, some aspect of his nature and his character that is a a mystery to us. In other words, God has chosen to reveal himself, and the way he chose to reveal himself is oftentimes through his names. But yet there's much of who he is that is beyond our finite understanding. In other words, God has not told us everything about himself. There's, there's a lot of him that even if he were to tell us about himself, we wouldn't be able to figure out. And also, there's a lot about himself that he has just chosen in his wisdom not to reveal to us and keep to himself. So I think this is a great place for us to start in our study today. Because today we're studying the return of Jesus. As we consider the return of Jesus, we must not envision it in a way that we think is best. We must not, must not put Jesus' return into a mold that we think is right or view it from a lens that, that makes sense to us or based upon concepts that we can fully understand or maybe things we've experienced. The first name we see of Jesus is the name that no one knows. And there's an aspect of the return of Christ, this most glorious and magnificent event that the world will ever see that is far beyond our understanding or imagination. I'm sure all of us as Christians have, have pictured the sky parting and Jesus coming back. And whatever you have in your mind is far less superior and glorious than what's actually going to take place on that day. I'll give you another name. Verse 11, he's called faithful and true. That name should sound familiar. Because back in chapter 3, verse 14, when Jesus talked about the seven churches, he used that name in reference to who he was as he was about to talk to that church in Laodicea. Laodicea was the bad, they were really bad, weren't they? Remember them? They were the lukewarm church. And Jesus basically told the church of Laodicea, these are people who claim to be his people, You better shape up. Because right now, I feel like I'm not even part of your church. As a matter of fact, I feel like I'm outside knocking on the door for you guys to let me back in. And I am faithful and true to judge you unless you shape up. And if you don't shape up, you're going to stop being a church and remove the lampstand out of its place. So if Jesus here is faithful and true to judge people who claim to be his people, how much more is he faithful and true to judge those who refuse to call themselves his people? See, this chapter is about judgment. He's not wishy-washy. He's not making this up as he goes along. He's not going to second-guess what he said and then do something else when he arrives. He speaks truth. That's another name for Jesus, truth. And he's faithful to do everything that he said he would do. I mean, the way I see it, the context of Revelation is very simple, the big picture. Jesus will vindicate his name. Jesus will deliver his followers, and Jesus will judge those who oppose him. And he is faithful and true to do that. There's no wiggle room. If you are an unbeliever in Christ, there's two directions. I pray the Holy Spirit pushes all of you guys. If you're an unbeliever in Christ, you should be scared to death when you hear this sermon. You should be fearful. And if you're a believer in Christ, you should leave with more hope than you could ever imagine. Because he is faithful to do what he said he will do. And what he says is always truth. Give you a third name. Verse 13. It says our Lord's name is the Word of God. He is the Word of God. 
Now, what's interesting is that phrase, I did a little search uh, this week, and that phrase pops up four other times in Revelation. But it never pops up, at least I couldn't tell a spot that it popped up, where it referred to Jesus himself as a name. It always refers to the testimony of his followers and the suffering they experienced because they held fast to the word of God. They believed what the Bible said, and they know that the Bible is the word of Jesus, and to honor Jesus is to honor his word. And they suffered because of that. In chapter 1, verse 2, John testified to the word of God, and it says in 1.9 that he was exiled to Patmos, the island Patmos, because of the word of God. In 6.9, remember those souls, those martyred souls underneath the altar who were slain because of the word of God. In chapter 20, verse 4, Lord of the next week, speaks of those who were beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. Well, you know Jesus is the word. John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus is the word. But what he's getting at here is the the fact that he is called the word of God because he will be judging the world in righteousness according to the word of God. My friends, if you hold fast to the word, and we've been learning this in Revelation, if you hold fast to the word, the word, you will be persecuted by the world, but yet you will be saved by the word. You with me on that? That's the way it's going to be. However, if you reject God's word, you will be welcomed by the world, but yet condemned by the word. It's just clear expectations. You accept it? Blessings for you. More than you can ever imagine. You reject it? Consequences. It's all spelled out. To love the word is to love Jesus. To love Jesus is to love the word. You don't separate them. To hate the word, to ignore the word, to reject the word is to reject Jesus. To reject Jesus is to reject the word. Jesus is the word. He was judged by the word. Give me a fourth one. Jump down to verse 16. Final name says, and this is one we heard Serge just sing about, he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Now that's written on his clothing, it says, for everyone to see. What a great name. I think it's rather self-explanatory. It simply says this, that there have been many kings that are alive and that have lived but he's the king above all kings. So if you stack them all up from the greatest to the least in terms of kings, Jesus is on the top. And there's been many lords now and ones that have lived and ones that will live in the future, but he is the Lord, capital L, over all the small L lords. And there's been superpowers throughout the history of the world. There's been men and women in charge of those superpowers that thought they were above all. There's been people and superpowers that have expected total allegiance. There's even been some who have claimed to be God himself and demanded worship. You kiss the ring, you bow the knee, or you will be killed. And that's what these Christians in Revelation were dealing with in the first century. Because that's how all the Caesars operated. They thought they were God. They expected worship of God. And the Christians said, everyone else is bowing down to you, but we can't do that, sir. Because the only Lord we worship is Jesus. Jesus is Lord, not you. You might be king. We might respect you as king as we should, but you're not Lord. We're not going to worship you. You're not at the end of the food chain. Jesus is. He's on top. We refuse. And we know that they paid paid with it dearly with their lives. Babylon was a superpower. There was a guy over Babylon, famous king named Nebuchadnezzar. What a big name, right? Nebuchadnezzar. And he saw it, as you read in the book of Daniel, to honor himself above God. He said, am I not the great Nebuchadnezzar of this great Babylon that I have built with my own power? We read in Daniel chapter 4 that God humbled him, and Nebuchadnezzar responds, yet I, Nebuchadnezzar, now praise and exalt and honor the king of heaven. For all of his works are true and his ways are just, and he's able to humble those who walk in pride. This is an amazing title that Jesus pulled for himself. 
Because there's only one king of kings and only one Lord of lords, and that is God. And when Jesus says, I'm king of kings and Lord of lords too, obviously the implication is he's head and shoulders above Muhammad and Buddha, Confucius, Gandhi, every world religion that's ever been invented by man. He is king of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus. He's not on par with them. What does it tell us about the fate of those who love this world and align themselves with what Revelation calls present-day Babylon? What does it say? What does it say about them? It says that is the epitome of foolishness because such people are committing spiritual treason against King Jesus. You see, I mean, it's, it's so polarizing. It's clear. You're going to see Revelation 19. So whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? Who's your king? Who's your Lord? Who are you worshiping? And parents, parents, if we believe this, as we should, does this in any way influence how we're bringing up our children? Because as I told my Sunday school, every single person on the planet, even the most staunch atheist, is a worshiper. We have been wired by our creator to be worshipers. And if we will not bow down to the true God, we will bow down to idols. You don't have to teach a kid to worship. A child will worship naturally. It's either the true God or it's idols. The God of self and the God of lust and the God of money and the God of pleasure and the God of greed. Who is your king based upon the way you act? What you think about? Who is your king? Who is your Lord? Does the buck stop with Jesus? Let's move from his names to the second point, the king's accessories. What I mean by accessories is, um, uh, what's he wearing? Or or, or who's with him when he comes back, okay? First one is his horse. You see that in verse 11? His horse is with him. Verse 11 says that John saw heaven opened, and again, you got to get this picture. Heaven is opening, And Christ appears riding a white horse. Now, you remember in Revelation, brothers and sisters, that that the colors are always very symbolic. And white always represents in Revelation, as it does almost the entire Bible, uh, purity. It represents holiness. So what it's saying is when Jesus is coming back, that he is unstained by sin. There is nothing sinful or impure about him. He is coming back in dazzling white. And it also is interesting, when you read Revelation, uh, stay with me on this, what is the most common term oftentimes used for his followers? What are you called in Revelation? Saints. Saints. Do you know that? Do you know that if you're a Christian, you're a saint? What does a saint mean? It's just from the Greek word hagios, which means holy ones. Do you realize that if you're in Christ that you've been washed clean in the blood of the Lamb, and that when God sees you positionally before the courtroom of heaven, he sees you as righteous as Christ. Do you know that? You you, you have to know that because everything is based upon that. The reason we pursue righteousness in our living is because we're already declared righteousness in the sight of God. When Christ went to the cross, all of your sin was nailed to him. Every one of them. And all of his perfect righteousness was given to you. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. So when God sees you, he does not see sin anymore. He sees Jesus. That gives us hope to get to the day. And that gives us great hope on the day of judgment that it's not based upon who I am or what I've done. It's based upon who Christ is and what he has done for me at Calvary. You see? We're saints. We're all saints, the Bible says. You say, I don't act like a saint. Well, you should. You say, I, I try hard and I fall short. Hey, we all do. Join the crowd. That's not an excuse. We move on. We repent from our sin. The Lord forgives us. And we're accepted always in his sight because he has cleansed us completely through the work of Christ. We're saints. You've been washed clean. And that's why we also see in Revelation and understanding that principle first and foremost, now our lifestyle comes. If you think that you just need to work harder and hopefully on the day of judgment be found right in God's eyes, I don't know how you go to sleep at night. 
Where, where, where do you draw the line? How do the scales balance out? Bottom line is you've been saved. God will always be your father. He will never unfather you. He loves you. Even when you blow it, you break the fellowship, but he still loves you. He welcomes you back with open arms. And because of that, now I live my life in a way that honors him through the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit that he supplies. And that's why you see in Revelation, these people, Jesus saying to them, don't swallow your garments with the world. Quit messing around with the world. Don't you realize who you are in my name and in my sight? You're white, you're clean, you're washed, you're pure. Why are you committing spiritual adultery with the great harlot? You see? Don't soil your garments, the, the, the specific words that he uses. Act the way you already are. You are white, now act white. Don't act that way because you're scared you might lose salvation or you might gain salvation. You've got it. Now is a manifestation of it. Live it out. Don't compromise with the world. Jesus is coming back on the white horse. He's coming back to rescue his distressed bride. He's coming back to defeat all of his enemies. Let me get another one. His eyes. How about his eyes? I mean, what a story. You know, you just think of man, raising three kids. I mean, this was, this was the story, wasn't it? The bride's in distress, and, and you think, oh, boy, it's, just, it's over. It's done. And at the last minute, who, Prince Charming comes back, right? On the white horse to rescue. They live happily ever after. That's right from the Bible. His eyes, his eyes uh, are called a flame of fire. You see in verse 12, we've already seen that description of him in verse 14, chapter 1, what we're getting at here is our Lord's ability to see and know all things. Again, it's so important to see this. This is Daniel chapter 10, verse 6. This is a description for God and God alone, and Jesus is using it for himself. He is the righteous judge of the world. You can't fool him. His eyes are a flame of fire. Nothing will escape his attention, folks. What you do in darkness, he sees. That's why he's a fair and righteous judge, because he knows everything that happens. His head, verse 12, has many diadems, it says. Remember I told you a couple months ago that Satan likes to copy God. He likes to ape God. God does miracles. Satan does false miracles, right? God is 777. Satan is 666. God is the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Satan is the unholy Trinity. Satan, Antichrist, false prophet. What do we read? On, on the head of Satan, chapter 12, verse 3, he has seven diadems. And on the head of the Antichrist, also known as the beast, in 13.1, he has ten diadems. So now we get to Christ, we're wondering, wow, seven and ten, those are the best numbers. Those are the numbers of perfection. They're trying to mock God, so God's not going to go with seven. God's got many of them. So what it's saying is basically, Satan, you have a period of time in which you rule, but your time has a beginning and your time has an end. Same for you, false prophet, and same for you, antichrist. And then we're going to see what happens to these guys. But God's sovereignty and God's kingship is not limited in any way. His reign is eternal. That's why they're just kings. And he's always king of kings. His robe, verse 13, is said to have been dipped in blood. What does that mean? If you're thinking what I was thinking when I first came to this passage, is I think very clear. They were talking about the sacrifice of Christ. You pick up the book of Revelation, you start reading. You're in chapter 1. By the time you get to verse 5, you read this. To him who loves us and has released us from our sins by his blood. And you keep reading, you get to chapter 5. You were slain, you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. The judgment is on the whole world, but Jesus came in fulfillment of all those Old Testament animal blood sacrifices to be the Lamb of God, the ultimate blood sacrifice who will allow himself to go to Calvary and be a blood sacrifice for our sins. And those who receive him, Revelation chapter 7 verse 14 says, we have been washed white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, 
Listen to Hebrews 9.28. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, once to bear the sins of many, what's that referring to? First coming. Will appear a second time. Oh, that's what we're covering today, right? For salvation, without reference to sin, to those who eagerly await him. First time, you've got to get this in your mind, first time Jesus comes humble, meek, Suffering servant, fulfillment of Isaiah 53, bloody lamb of God, sacrifice. Second time, he's not coming as the lamb of God, he's coming as the line of Judah to either reward or to judge all humanity based upon what they do with the love offering that God has given them in Christ. You see, the standard is always righteousness. God will judge according to his perfect character. That's the standard. So Jesus comes back, and I'm, I, mean, I kind of envision it like this. He comes back and sees the Christian and says, okay, are you standing on your righteousness or my righteousness? And we say, oh, your righteousness, Jesus. I got no righteousness of my own I could bring to this. I got no hope of being saved. I'm a sinner. You can't allow me one sin in your presence. He says, that's the right answer. You've been following me faithfully all your life. And I see you. I'm judging you on righteousness, but the righteousness that's applied to you is my righteousness, and therefore you're in heaven. What about you? I'm staying on my good deeds. Really? You know any sin? Well, a little bit. Who doesn't? Then you're judged on your righteousness too. There's no heaven for you. Now that's all true. But I don't know if that's what John's getting at here. Most people think it is. I don't think it is. That's all true. Listen to this prophecy from Isaiah 53. Now, again, the context here we're talking about is the robe that's dipped in blood. Listen to Isaiah 53. Who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Basra? This one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. Is it I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save? Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads the winepress? I've trodden the wine trough alone, and from the peoples there was no man with me. I also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath, and their life brought is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained all my raiment, for the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. You know, John oftentimes used the Old Testament when he wrote Revelation. I think it is crystal clear what he was reading when he wrote chapter 19 that the blood on Jesus is not his own, but rather evidence of the warfare and victory over his enemies. Also with him is his armies, verse 14. Again, you don't, you don't bring armies to a time of peace. They're also clothed in white. Let's go to the last point, the third point, the king's actions. The king's actions. Verse 11 says this. He's coming to judge and wage war in perfect righteousness. My friends, let me say it again. What God expects of all of creation, the standard of God that he imposes upon all people when it comes to judgment day is the perfect righteousness that he has in himself. So what I'm simply saying is this, that if you commit one sin, you're a sinner. That's why God says you can do everything the Bible says, but when you violate one aspect of his law, you will become a lawbreaker. You might say, well, I only told one lie my entire life. Well, that's a lie probably in and of itself, isn't it? And you're probably not including white lies and exaggerations and everything else that would be in the line of deception. But if you tell one lie, you're still a liar. I only stole one thing in my life. I stole some sticky notes, let's say, from the uh, cabinet in my office place and brought it home. Still a thief. You know, when the police officer pulls you over for going too fast, you don't, you don't say, well, you know, officer, you don't understand. I've been driving for 45 years. I've never violated the speed limit. So therefore, you've got to let me go. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You broke the law, and you have every, he has every right to give you a violation, a ticket, a citation. The same thing goes here, that, that if we think we can stand before Christ, who will judge us based upon perfect righteousness, based upon our righteousness as we've lived our life on this earth, we don't stand a chance. 
I don't know why people have such a hard time getting this. He's not going to lower the bar, folks. Hey, that's close enough. No hope. There's no hope. But what we couldn't do for ourselves, he did for us, right? Because he's also a God of love, folks. He's a God of mercy and kindness and compassion. And he knows that the only way we ever have any chance of being with him is that if someone would take away our sin and deal with the sin problem, and that's why in his mercy and love, he sent Jesus Christ the first time to deal with the sin problem on the cross. And those who embrace him, he gives us the promise that you are forgiven, that you're washed as clean as snow, that you're white, that you're no longer my enemy, that you're now reconciled to me, and we have fellowship, and I will adopt you into my family and be your father, and you'll always be my child, and on judgment day, you will not get harmed in any way, and you will be with me forever and ever in glory. You need Christ to do that. And then what about those he he gives the offer to, and they say, I don't want what you have to offer me, God. I'd rather do it on my own. I want to base it upon how many times I go to church and how many good deeds I've done and all the bad things I didn't do that other people do that I like to compare myself to. And that's how I want you to judge me. It doesn't work that way, folks. It does not work that way. What's left for them? They kick mud in God's face and then they expect to make it through judgment day on their own righteousness? They're not going to stand a chance. They will face then his righteous judgment. And he is faithful and true to do all that he has promised. Isaiah 11.4 But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Revelation 19 is that the king is coming back to wage war. I mean look at verse 15. He comes back as words compared to a sharp sword that comes from his mouth. Not a literal sword. It's a, it's a death-dealing pronouncement which goes from the lips of Christ like a sharp blade. His ruling, verse 15, he will strike down the nations and will rule them with a rod and iron straight from Psalm 2. His wrath, and he will tread the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. My friends, can you come up with a more frightening picture that describes what God's enemies will fear on that last day? He will tread the winepress. Remember that one? I taught, you, I taught you about that one, didn't I already? Because we covered that already. That in Israel, they um, uh, primarily the water was just all kind of contaminated, so they would kind of dilute their wine, and uh, that was basically what they drank. They drank wine all the time, so you needed to make a lot of wine, and uh, they didn't have the technology we have today, so they had to get grapes. They had grapes vineyards all over the place, but you had to get it into juice, and the way they'd get the grapes into juice is they'd, they'd throw thousands of grapes into this big vat. It was a, usually a stone, big stone vat. And it had little tiny holes in the bottom and you'd have to smash the grapes. So what you'd do is you, it was all, it was all people power back then. You'd, you'd get a bunch of people, they'd jump in there, uh, have a little party and they just would keep stomping on the grapes. They'd smash them all down. Just keep walking around in the grapes. And as the grapes would get squeezed down, that's the wine press, squeezing the grapes down, the, 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 the outside, the skin would stay in the vat, but the juice would sort of come out of those little holes. That's the picture. That's the visual that God has chosen as to how we will respond to those who reject him. That is not a painting of a grandfatherly type God. That is not the painting of God that you see in Hollywood. Sadly, that is not the painting of God you see in many American churches today. Verse 15, my friends, look in your Bible for yourself. Those without Christ will face the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. Happy Mother's Day, ladies. Wow! You going to take chances with that? One commentator said, the building up of sin throughout all of history reaches its peak in the last generation of history and makes the wicked ripe for retributive har- harvest. Retributive harvest. Let me just wrap it up here. Listen to how his victory is described. Look at verse 17. This is the battle. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, 
And he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God. There's a clear comparison, or I should say maybe a contrast, to what we learned at the beginning of chapter 19, which talked about the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? The marriage supper of the Lamb is what his children are invited to, a blessed time to consummate our relationship with Christ. He is the bridegroom, we are the bride of Christ. We are now coming together to enjoy eternity as one. Marriage of the Lamb, right? And now you see the contrast to that. For those who don't know Jesus, the birds are invited to this, 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 this feast here, this great supper of God. Because the carnage from the war, that you may eat the flesh and the kings and the flesh of commanders, all these great people that thought they were so great bossing the Christians around, right? And the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, small and great, Bottom line is no one's excluded. And I saw the beast, that was the, the Antichrist, right? And the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. We've been covering this. This is the battle of Armageddon. They finally think like, man, we, this is it. It's all coming down. This. We're going to take him down. We're going to take God down. And we're wondering, man, what, that, what a battle. I can't wait to read about that battle. That's going to be an interesting story. You get nothing in the scripture. Nothing's even said of the battle. Only the result. Because the battle's a joke. The beast is seized, that's the Antichrist with him, the false prophet. There's the third person of the unholy trinity who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who have received the mark. We've covered all this. And of the beast and those who worship his image, we've covered that. And the two, the beast and the Antichrist, or the beast and the false prophet, were thrown alive in a lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. We're going to come back to that in future chapters, so I'll skip my comments of that. And the rest were killed the sword, which came up from the mouth of him who sat on the throne, horse, and the birds were filled with their flesh. You know what I was thinking about last night, late last night? Um, when, when Craig and I, Pastor Craig and I, flew to uh, Armenia. We went to Armenia, as you know, last summer. And we have a tremendous relationship with uh, the churches over there. We are good friends with the president of the whole Baptist Union. And uh, he has given us basically the golden key, which means when we go there, he brings all the pastors of the nation together. We had about 100 pastors assembled, and we got to teach these guys how to be better pastors. What an influence we have with the nation of Armenia. And uh, Craig and I went over there last summer. We taught at their pastor's conference for a few days, as you know. And we, we, we left Newark, but we got on a, a Russian. I've never been to Moscow before. We got on a Russian airline. And uh, this plane was massive. I mean, I'm looking at maybe three times as long as this sanctuary. Huge jumbo jet. And we're walking down, and unfortunately, the size of the seats and the room they give you is not proportionate to the size of the plane. So I'm thinking 10 hours. Now, again, this is about my normal arm, arm distance. Uh, the plane was probably about like this. Okay? And you know you got a guy on either side that's trying to beat you for those little armrests. And the legs are almost up above my chest. And I thought, all you tall people can totally empathize with me on this one. I thought, I, I, I can't do this for 10 hours. There is just no way. This just isn't going to happen. So I do what I always do when I get on flights. I start looking around, right, for open seats. And I notice about seven, to eight, ten seats ahead of us, there are three seats in an aisle right next to an emergency door, and no one is sitting in them. So I kind of give Pastor Craig the elbow. I said, I'm going to go take one of those seats up there. He says, you can't do that. You're not allowed to do that. I said, uh, so watch me. <laughs> I'm going to do it. And I grab my things, and I go up, and I sit down. And, I, and Craig was almost like he had the stopwatch on me. He goes, okay, I'll give him two minutes. If no one kicks him out, I'm going to join him. And sure enough, in two minutes, he was right next to me. <laughs> and he's kind of chilling out. You know, the plane's about ready to take off. And he's like, this is pretty good. And I, I know, but don't celebrate yet. It's not the way it works. Don't celebrate yet. And this um, short guy, probably about this tall, Russian flight attendant, young man, comes up to us, doesn't crack a smile, looks us straight in the eye and says, can I see boarding pass? I said, oh, hey, oh, sorry about that. You know, these are not our real seats. We're back there, but I'm a tall guy. I'm a tall guy, and this is a long flight, and I just, you know, it would be very uncomfortable. I saw no one sitting in these seats. I'm sure you don't mind if I, and he just cut me off, didn't say a word, didn't crack a smile, and says, if you do not move, I go tell captain. (laughs) I said, whoa, dude, chill. I don't think the captain, he's got a 1,000 people in this plane, wants to deal with me in this seat right now. I said, I will gladly move don't worry about it. But I also learned a lesson that I'm not an American anymore, right? Because in America, we negotiate, don't we? 
right? We like to negotiate with people. And in Russia, you don't negotiate. That's the stereotype. Maybe it's not true all the time, but the stereotype was fulfilled for me that day. They tell you to do something, you better take them seriously, or there will be consequences. What's my takeaway from all this? Why do I share that story? When I read Revelation, I'm getting this picture very clear in my mind that, that, that we are all hopeless sinners. That we, we don't, brothers and sisters, we don't stand a chance. There's no chance of ever being saved on our own. And I, I get this clear picture in Revelation that, that God is a judge. In other words, he created us. He's revealed his word to us clearly. He set it all up. He says, this is who I am. This is what you must do. You can't do it, but I provided a way for you to be saved if you believe in Jesus. And if you choose to believe in Jesus, this is what will happen. And if you choose not to believe in Jesus, this is what will happen. Very simple. If you love Jesus, which is seen not in a prayer you prayed or the words you might utter from your lips, but if you really love Jesus, which is seen, as Jesus said, in a desire and ability to obey and follow his commandments, you will be saved. But if you reject Jesus because you're rejecting the word, you will be condemned. Like that Russian Airlines, there's no negotiating. He is faithful and true. What he said, he will do. And that means if you're here without Christ, my friends, only God can convince you of this and get you to believe and change your heart. I can't do that, but I, but I can at least show you where the water is and say, if you leave this sanctuary thinking, I don't need Jesus, you are clearly going against what Scripture says is good for you. Clearly. And when you die or when Jesus returns, whichever one comes forth in, first in your life, and one of them will come, you're in big trouble. And if you're here with Christ, you read this and say, Lord, I love you above all things. And though I've not done as, as good as I should, my life's ambition has been to please you. And I trust your word and I know you are there and you're a good God and Jesus has died for every one of my sins and I base my entire hope and confidence not in myself but completely on what you have done and you have revealed to me in the word of God. If that's your attitude, you read this section and you got great hope. This isn't a day you should be afraid of. You won't be judged this day because Christ took the judgment for you. God's wrath is coming. One way or another, either Christ took the wrath for you or you will take the wrath for yourself. There's no exceptions. Because he who said it is faithful and true and he will do all that he promised. Father, we thank you for your blessed return. And Lord, when we consider what people are experiencing as we speak, when we consider what the church experienced in the early age, we pray as we should be praying, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Lord, forgive us for loving this world too much. I know there's a part of me, and I'm sure there's a part of many in this room that love you tremendously that just say, oh, I don't know. I, I kind of like the life the way it is right here. Forgive us for that, Lord. Help us, Lord, even as comfortable as we are in this country as Christians, and we're thankful for the protection you've given us. Help us, Lord, to desire your return to want to be here when our king comes back for us and rescues his bride. And thank you for the confidence, Lord, the confidence that we can have, that we can know that when you come back, that we will be on your team. What tremendous hope that is. And that gives us, as we go through life, so much joy and so much peace, regardless of our circumstances. Bless us, Lord. Bless your church in this regard. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.